I'm George Yamasaki, and um, my heavy connection with the Western edition came during the period of time when I was uh, one of the attorneys for National Braemar Inc., uh, which was the designated developer of what was then called the Japanese Cultural and Trade Center and has subsequently been renamed by us, actually, uh, the Japan Center because we felt it was misleading to the public for what was basically a shopping center and hotel and theater complex uh, to have this uh, cachet of culture to it. Although, I must say, we did have we were able to introduce some culture, meaningful culture, uh, during the time that we were involved. We brought uh, a branch of the Asian Art Museum to the Japan Center, which sadly no longer uh, is uh, operating there. But my involvement, as I say, was very heavy uh, during the latter part of the 60s and the uh, uh, first half of the 70s. I've been involved with the Cherry Blossom Festival uh, since 1970 as a volunteer. Uh, so I've had this continuing connection with uh, probably the major event of the Western edition for 50 years, uh, but I've never lived here. Uh, I had my office here briefly when I was uh, representing the uh, developer. I'm originally from Hawaii. I'm what's called uh, uh, an older sansei. Uh, my maternal grandfather uh, arrived in Hawaii we believe, in 1886, uh, which is a few years earlier than uh, many of the uh, families that came to the mainland the United States. Can you describe in more detail um, your time, you know, uh, serving uh, your involvement in, you know, the whole Japantown and the redevelopment of it? Sure. Um, in the uh, 60s, the uh, city and county of San Francisco, like many, many uh, metropolitan areas of the United States, embarked on a redevelopment program. It was a federal program, and uh, it was the accepted practice of the time. It was designed to... Uh, rehabilitate uh, areas that had fallen into disrepair. It turned out to, to be fraught with problems, which may or may not have been anticipated uh, at the beginning, but uh, it, it turned into a very controversial program throughout the country and certainly here in San Francisco. Um, this part of the Western edition is called, uh, was called officially Western edition A1. And uh, uh, that's, uh, there's a little bit of maybe underground humor there because, uh, you know, A1 is a term for first class first rate, that sort of thing. And I'm sure that the opponents of redevelopment would uh, conclude that the Western edition redevelopment was anything but A1. However, that was the uh, designation. And uh, when people speak of it or spoke of it then, and even now recalling it, uh, refer to it, they, they call it a1. 
and that is the uh, south side of Post Street, which includes the Japan Center. The north side, which was developed by the community, the Japanese American community itself and other property owners and uh, people involved uh, prior to redevelopment in that area, uh, in effect, had a uh, significant say in what happened there uh, through a nonprofit sponsored by the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency uh, called the Nihonmachi Community Development Corporation. Uh, I was a member of the board of directors of that, but that was really a community uh, project headed by Mas Ashizawa, who was a major property owner and business owner. Uh, I'm sure many people are, are familiar with and even customers of Soko Hardware on the corner of the Buchanan Mall and Post Street. And uh, Moss was the president of the NCDC, as it was known, Nihonmachi Community Development Corporation. And the vice president was Yori Wada, who subsequently became a regent of the University of California and was then the executive director of the Buchanan YMCA, which is south of uh, Geary and, and is still in the same building. Uh, and he was looked upon as kind of the honest broker because he was not a business person. Uh, he was not a property owner. And the attorney for the NCDC was uh, Victor Abe, who had pre-existing uh, law offices in uh, the A2 area. Can you uh, tell us more about your involvement with the Cherry Blossom Festival? Sure. Uh, when I came out here uh, as the as one of the attorneys for the developer National Braemar, uh, I was also tasked with um, attending to their interests uh, as a developer and one of the uh, successor owners of the Japan Center. Now that's a whole other story about the Byzantine structure of the Japan Center and one of its really serious shortcomings. So if I may, uh, I'd like to digress on that for a moment. National Braemar was chosen as the developer, actually solicited by the uh, uh, head of the redevelopment agency, Justin Herman, who has in 2019 become a very controversial person. His name was stripped from the plaza uh, down by the ferry building. Uh, and Mark Buell, who was the president, who is the president of the uh, uh, Rec Park agency, voted against that change of name. Uh, and I must say that there's great merit in Mark's position because Justin Herman uh, has unjustly been characterized as uh, racist and uncaring and ruthless. Uh, my experience with him was quite to the contrary. Justin was a man of great taste great vision and concern for people, uh, not just of one group, but people as a whole. And what he sought was what he and the, the powers that be at the time believed sincerely would be best for the city and county of San Francisco. I have never ever heard of Justin doing 
anything that might be uh, considered negatively racially motivated or uh, as a um, detriment to the economically disadvantaged. I think that's extremely unfair. But anyway, as I say, the uh, concept behind the Japan Center when it came into being was that it would feature Japanese uh, businesses. And of course, Justin was hoping for culture and unfortunately didn't get much of it. Uh, but it was a very difficult time because in the 60s, Japan was still in a recovery phase and there were strict uh, economic and currency restrictions on the transfer of funds outside of Japan. So the, the trick of getting Japanese uh, businesses, Japanese corporations, to, to invest in a project here in San Francisco was daunting, to say the least. What came about was that National Braemar developed the entire center. Uh, I believe the figure was, in those days, about $10 million. But bear in mind, that's the 60s, so multiply that by whatever you want, and you come out with a pretty large number. Now, it, it covered the three blocks from Laguna to Fillmore and uh, Geary to Post. Starting at the east end was then the Miyako Hotel uh, and the Japanese Consulate General. And then the uh, driveway for the hotel and what we call the east building, which was, oh, let me back up, the uh, Consulate General building and the Miyako Hotel were uh, ultimately purchased, and this was all prearranged, by Kintetsu of Japan, a uh, subsidiary of Kinki Railways, a conglomerate, a, a very large conglomerate. Uh, and then the East Building, which National Braemar retained. The Peace Plaza, which National Braemar retained, with the exception of the keyhole pool and the peace pagoda, which was a gift of the people of Japan and designed by the eminent architect, uh, architect uh, Professor Yoshiro Taniguchi. Uh, that was given to the city and county of San Francisco. So that's a separate parcel. And it, it as I say, was in the shape of a keyhole because there was a uh, pool that housed the plaza. Then the next building, uh, what is what is now called the, the West Mall, but was then called the Kintetsu Mall because it was uh, purchased by Kintetsu. Uh, and then the Webster Street Bridge, which was retained by National Braemar, the what we call the West Building, which is now called the Kinokuniya Building, which was retained by National Braemar. And uh, the theater complex, uh, which included the uh, hot springs, um, which was a, originally a theater restaurant, really a spectacular uh, operation. Uh, ultimately purchased by Dream Entertainments, headed by a man named Kunizo Matsuo, who although he, was, he did not make animated films, he was known as the Walt Disney of Japan because he was the number one entertainment figure in Japan at the time. Now underneath, and this is all condominium, really a, a mind-boggling kind of uh, arrangement. Uh, 
the areas are split up. The uh, city-owned garage is subsurface. Um, oh, backing up just for a second, in the East Building, the then Bank of Tokyo owned its office and some community space in that building, uh, in the East Building. And I believe they still do. Uh, anyway, th there were these multiple owners of a shopping center and a hotel and theater uh, complex. And believe me, that's no way to structure a shopping center. Uh, it, it was very difficult to get the, the support the financial support for one, but the discipline that uh, a coordinated shopping center requires. And that's something that uh, has prevailed to this day, actually gotten worse, I believe, because although I haven't kept up, there have been subsequent sales and uh, there are even more owners and- uh, Sounds messy. There, there's just no coordination. I shouldn't say no coordination, but uh, certainly not the kind of coordination that's necessary to successfully promote a shopping center. And this was even before shopping centers uh, experienced their downturn in which uh, they're currently suffering. Uh, one point to make is that the uh, Peace Plaza is now owned by the city and county of San Francisco. The, the city and county always had the keyhole pool, which uh, houses the Peace Pagoda. Uh, initially, National Weimar tried and, and offered to give the Peace Plaza to the city and county of San Francisco. But uh, this is an interesting story. Uh, in those days, in the 60s, Stonestown Mall, which is now an enclosed mall, was an open mall, as was the uh, practice in those days. And uh, Bob Keneally, who was the city attorney assigned to the project, the uh, Japan Center project, reacted to the offer of the gift of the Peace Plaza uh, by saying, well, that's absurd. That would be like the city owning the Stonestown Mall. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, however, you know, after the ethnic identity and the student demonstrations and uh, all of the civil rights protests, uh, the city purchased the uh, Peace Plaza from uh, an entity to which uh, National Braemar had, had sold the, uh, the plaza. So anyway, there are all kinds of very odd, uh, curious quirks in the history of, this, uh, of the Japan Center. And with regard to the Cherry Blossom Festival, uh, the Cherry Blossom Festival came to, into being in March 1968 uh, with the opening of the Japan Center. And there was an enormous city celebration. Uh, all kinds of distinguished visitors uh, attended the opening ceremony. But by contrast, the first Cherry Blossom Parade was something like four blocks just around Japantown. Now, of course, it runs from City Hall to Japantown. It's, it's a huge extravaganza. Uh, it started out fairly large, but, but not anywhere the scale uh, that it is today. And it was really uh, intended to bring attention to the opening of 
the Japan Center. But throughout the years, thanks to the incredible volunteer work of literally hundreds, maybe thousands of people, but a few very key people, uh, the Japan Center is a major um, event in San Francisco, uh, the, the two week weekends festival, uh, now in April. Uh, after that first year, it was decided that March was a little risky as far as the weather is concerned, although that's pretty much when the cherry blossoms actually bloom. This last year, uh, another a uh, bit of strange weather, and we actually had the cherry blossoms in full bloom during the two weekends of our festival. The festival has become uh, a, a something that you cannot even experience in Japan. My understanding is that in Japan there are festivals of all kinds, but they are generally limited to one discipline or, or one element of the culture. Uh, here, our Cherry Blossom Festival showcases as much as we can of the magnificent heritage of Japan. And so in one place, a visitor can see everything from bonsai to uh, ikebana to origami to martial arts to uh, you name it. Uh, and we have our uh, Japanese American elements like the Queen program. Uh, and now we have the, uh, well I shouldn't say now, it's been here for a number of years, we have the uh, Web Street stage and the uh, contemporary entertainment. And of course, we've always had the food, which combines everything from uh, Japanese food uh, to uh, what is now probably the most popular uh, food item in the festival, the kimochi. Terry Burger, which uh, combines the best of both worlds, you might say. So we're very proud of that festival. We, we hope it will continue, but uh, there is some concern about its future as well as the future of Japantown as a whole because uh, demographics have changed, uh, lifestyles have changed, uh, there is sadly not the core group of uh, first generation Japanese who have, who had first hand knowledge and, and real sincere affection for elements of the culture of Japan. But let's hope for the best. We've had a good run of uh, over 50 years and uh, and do you think you'll be continuing to MC the festival well as, I as don't long know how as much it longer <laughs> I can do this but uh, I'll try thank you're you you're the voice <laughs> thank you so you kind of touched up on this already but what do you envision for the future of the cherry blossom and also the future of you know the western Japan town and the western edition community as a whole well, I have to say my crystal ball is very clouded. Uh, I see many uh, problems, uh, and they're not intentional by any means. They're just evolutionary. Uh, way back when, Japanese and Japanese Americans were in many instances forced to become entrepreneurs. They were forced to become small business people. Uh, they had degrees from the University of California, 
but they couldn't find any jobs in their field. So they would open uh, businesses or restaurants. Uh, there was no alternative, no significant alternative. But that's very, very hard work, very demanding, uh, very stressful. And now uh, the Japanese Americans uh, who are now in their third, fourth, fifth generation are, <laughs> in a way, so assimilated and uh, so successfully a part of the greater community that, uh, and so well educated, well prepared, uh, they are able to find conventional jobs with uh, uh, 401ks and uh, uh, health benefits and reasonable hours without the headaches of owning and operating their own businesses. Also, there's been a lot of uh, marriage outside the, uh, the Japanese race. And so uh, inevitably, there isn't the uh, direct connection to, to Japanese uh, culture, customs, tradition. Uh, and there's so many uh, pulls on, on people for their time and energy that uh, th there are it, it it's going to be a, a I hope it it works out, but it, it it's going to be a delicate balancing act to keep uh, Japantown really Japantown, uh, and uh, to keep the festival uh, alive and as uh, significant, especially in the cultural ways. Um, as it has been. I think that the uh, Cherry Blossom Festival has in its own way contributed to the acceptance, if you will, of the Japanese American following World War II by the greater community. Uh, you know, people kind of uh, I won't say forget, but minimize the fact that they were, the Japanese were uh, parodied and, and maligned uh, as, as the yellow peril, the vicious enemy. And now they're generally accepted uh, as a part of uh, the greater community. Thank you so much, George. Thank you for all that you shared. Thank you.